Today is January the 20th, 2021. Welcome to the award-winning Personal Computer Radio Show. I'm Hank Key, and my colleague is Joe King. Do you know who has your personal data? Do you know how Facebook, Google, Amazon, and other big tech companies are using your personal data? Our website is pcradioshow.org. We are heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, streaming on the Internet. Podcasts of the program is available on prn.fm on the Internet. You can leave us a message with your question or comment at hank at pcradioshow.org. Intel has replaced CEO Bob Swan, and he will be succeeded on February 15th by former Intel veteran Pat Gelsinger. After corporate blunders and setbacks, Intel ousts CEO Bob Swan. The embattled U.S. chip giant makes move just days before a strategy update. Intel is replacing its chief executive, Bob Swan, after a series of manufacturing setbacks and competitive blunders that lost the veteran Silicon Valley company its crown as the top U.S. chipmaker. Swan, its former finance chief, who held the top job for just over two years, will be succeeded on February 15th by former Intel veteran Pat Gelsinger, who is currently chief executive of VMware, the infrastructure software group. Last July, Intel was overtaken by NVIDIA as the most valuable chip company in the United States after it delayed its next generation of chips because of manufacturing problems. Since then, Swan has been under pressure to decide whether Intel would invest further in chip making to compete with its rivals, Taiwan Semiconductor Company, and Samsung, or start to outsource more production to them. Activist hedge fund advisors Intel to outsource CPU manufacturing. Gelsinger had previously spent 30 years at Intel, including as its chief technology officer before he left just over a decade ago to join VMware, former parent company EMC. Intel had about $60 billion wipe off its market capitalization in 2020. The biggest shock came in July when its shares fell 17% in a day after it revealed it was 12 months behind schedule in developing the new process technology needed to manufacture its latest generation of chips. Swan, a former eBay executive, was promoted in January of 2019 following the resignation of Brian Krasnick, who failed to disclose an affair with another employee. Apple's announcement in mid-2020 that it would be shifting its Macs away from Intel to an ARM-based processor of its own design show that Intel still faced vigorous competition. NVIDIA $40 billion plan acquisition of ARM, the UK chip company, whose designs power the vast majority of mobile devices, will only add to the pressure on Intel. Costco is shutting all remaining in-store photo departments in Canada and United States by February the 14th. American wholesaler retailer, Costco informed customers in an email sent earlier that it will be closing all remaining photo centers inside of the United States and Canada warehouses by February the 14th. Back in 2015, Costco started cutting back on its store photography department when it announced it would no longer offer film development services. Then in March of 2019, Costco took it a step further and announced it would be closing a number of in-store photo departments due to insufficient demand. Costco never specified which warehouses lost its photo departments, but reports confirmed stores in at least three states. Massachusetts, Hawaii, and California has been shut down. In Costco's email announcement, which went out to customers, the retailer cites a lack of demand due to the smartphone and social media. The email read in part as follows. Since the introduction of camera phones and social media, the need for printing photos has steeply declined, even though the number of pictures taken continues to grow. After careful consideration, we have determined the continued decline of prints no longer requires on-site photo printing. The photo department closures will also affect the retailer's home movie video transfer 
passport photo, photo restoration, and ink cartridge refill services. Costco requests any orders placed ahead of the February 14th cutoff date be picked up in stores no later than March the 28th of this year. Even though in-store photo services will no longer be around, Costco will continue to offer online photo printing services via its website, costcophotocenter.com. There is an app on the iPhone and on the Android phones, and the app is called Signal Messaging, or Signal. Signal has previously been the communications method of choice for activists, people in the hacker community, and others concerned about privacy. Recently, it's gone mainstream. My granddaughters are using it, so I had to get more information from them. Recently, Facebook-owned WhatsApp, which is end-to-end encrypted using Signal's protocol, began using a privacy update notification to users, making clear that it is sharing user data with Facebook, which it has actually been doing for years. That has led people to look elsewhere for a secure communications app, helped along by Elon Musk's January 7th tweet, which simply stated, Use Signal. Over the past three years, Signal has been investing in more infrastructure and features to support its users. That's a good thing. Signal first saw an increase in users in the spring as people participating in anti-racist protests around the killing of George Floyd, realized how closely law enforcement was surveilling them and asking companies to hand over user data. It only became more popular since then. Signal is at the top of the Apple App Store and Google Play Store, and its two-factor authentication onboarding system even got briefly delayed a few days ago because so many people were trying to sign up. So thinking about joining Signal... Bottom line is, if you care about privacy, it's a good idea. But here's what you need to know. Signal is a free, privacy-focused messaging and voice talk app you can use on Apple and Android smartphones, and also on the desktop. All you need is a phone number to join. You can text or make voice or video calls with friends, either one-on-one or in groups, and use emoji reactions or stickers just like in the other apps. But there's one big difference. Signal is actually really private. Is the Signal app secure? Communications on Signals are end-to-end encrypted, which means only the people in messages can see the content of those messages. Not even the company itself. Even sticker packs get their own special encryption. Signal created the encryption protocol, basically the technical way you implement this, that other companies, including WhatsApp and Skype, use. Plainly put, it is the gold standard of privacy. Is Signal the company really private? Yes, and that privacy goes beyond the fact that the content of your messages is encrypted. You can set messages to disappear after certain customizable time frames. Plus, Signal collects virtually no data on its users. The only information you give the app is your phone number, and the company is even working a way to decouple that from using Signal by using encrypted contact servers. If the police comes knocking on the door of Signal for data on its users, it can truthfully say it has no data to hand over. Part of the reason it collects no data is because Signal is a non-profit organization, not a for-profit company. It has no advertising, so no incentive to track users. Instead, is funded by grants and private investors. So, I asked what is the business model as a nonprofit to stay in business if there's no advertising and there's no fundraising? Well, there's a small group of privacy activists that created Signal in 2013. It has grown in recent years, and in 2018, WhatsApp founder Brian Acton donated $50 million to create the Signal Foundation, which now runs Signal. Acton got on board with the mission to make a truly private messaging service after Facebook acquired WhatsApp. So what are the differences between Signal versus WhatsApp? Both Signal and WhatsApp are end-to-end encrypted using the same technology. That means the content of the messages you send and calls you have are both private. However, Facebook collects lots of other information in the form of usage statistics metadata, and more. There's no longer a way to opt out. 
Signal does not have many fancy customization features as WhatsApp, like backgrounds, but when it comes to true privacy, there is no comparison. Signal does not moderate content, but it does limit groups to a thousand and is more about communicating with people who are actual contacts joining groups of strangers like on WhatsApp and Telegram. You can find Signal in Apple's App Store or in the Google Play Store. Elon Musk just recently disclosed funding WhatsApp rival Signal. He says he'll donate more if needed. Musk said that he is a benefactor to the messaging app Signal. What happened? The entrepreneur said on Twitter that he had donated to Signal a year ago and he will donate more. The free and open source messaging app saw a surge of users after Musk endorsed it earlier a couple weeks ago in a separate tweet. Musk has taken to Twitter after the attack on the United States Capitol by supporters of outgoing President Trump and made a thinly veiled attack on social networks, specifically Facebook and CEO Mark Zuckerberg, without directly naming any individual or entity. Why it matters? Facebook, the owner of the rival messaging app, WhatsApp, is also mired in controversy after it unveiled a new privacy policy for WhatsApp, which comes into effect in February. The privacy policy reportedly no longer provides users the option to opt out of data sharing with Facebook, but instead outlines how WhatsApp will share with its social networking parent. Forbes reported, data to be shared includes battery level, signal strength, app version, browser information, mobile network, and connection information, including phone number, mobile operator, ISP, language, time zone, IP address, device operations information, and identifiers. The privacy policy changes are aimed at facilitating data sharing between Facebook and WhatsApp and does not effectively change consumer chaps. However, the social media backlash has meant that WhatsApp users are opting to join Signal, an app co-founded by Brian Acton, who was also a WhatsApp co-founder and has been critical of Facebook privacy policies, and throw into that, Elon Musk is putting his money into it. So now I learned something about my granddaughters. They had been using WhatsApp. They no longer use it. They now use Signal. Microsoft has to fix a Windows 10 bug that can corrupt a hard disk drive just by looking at an icon. It's a bizarre bug. Microsoft says it's planning to fix a Windows 10 bug that could corrupt a hard drive just by looking at an icon. Security researcher first warned about the bug, describing it as a nasty vulnerability. Attackers can hide a specially crafted line inside a zip file, folder, or even a simple Windows shortcut. All Windows 10 user needs to do is extract the zip file or simply look at a folder that contains a malicious shortcut and it will automatically trigger hard drive corruption. Microsoft says that they are aware of this issue and will provide an update in a future release. The use of this technique relies on social engineering and as always, they encourage their customers to practice good computing habits online including exercising caution when opening unknown files or accepting file transfers. Others have found that the vulnerability also occurs if you simply paste the offending string into the address bar in a browser. They noted that it would prompt Windows 10 users to reboot a PC to repair the corrupted disk records. The reboot will trigger the Windows check disk process, which should successfully repair the corruption. The repair process isn't always automatic, though, and it may require manual intervention to successfully repair the corrupted disk records. The bug also doesn't require admin rights to trigger or special right permissions. That could make it more problematic for IT admins if check disk fails to automatically repair affected drives. Let's hope it doesn't happen to you. Presenting Benjamin Rockwell with his IT Pro Series. Brian asks about allowing guest access on his network. This is Benjamin Rockwell, and now it's time for us to get down to business. 
This is where I come to you with my 30 years of experience of being an IT professional, and we talk about the different things that are going on in your work environment. Now, sometimes what happens is I do get contacted by IT professionals, sometimes budding young IT professionals who want to know the right thing to do. In this case, Brian reached out to me and he said, should I allow guest accounts on the network? Should I allow Wi-Fi accounts? Should I allow it for printing? Should I allow it for computer access? Should I allow it for internet access? And my answer, the, 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 I'm going to give you the short answer right now, no. Now, uh, let me rephrase that. No, 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 that, that uh, no, don't do it. Um, yeah, uh, don't do it. I think that sums it up. Not a chance. Never. Here's the thing. Okay, my my background includes a number of different industries. One of the industries I've worked in is aerospace, and that gave me quite an education in this realm. Okay. Before it was a matter of, yeah, it's a bad practice. It is a bad practice to allow someone on your network who does not have access. Should you set up guest accounts? No. Because if you set up a guest account, that gives somebody access to your information, a subset of your information. Except if they have a subset of access, they have a small amount of access. There's a deep, dark, dirty secret in the hacker world, which is if I have physical access to your server, I have access to everything. If I have access to your network, I have access to everything. They, they, they just have to have the access. Now, are you going to have hackers wandering into your company? Uh, how do you know? Uh, how, how do you know if they are a hacker or not? It's not like they usually wander around saying, I'm a hacker, I know all kinds of different things. And, uh, yeah, there's, you know, uh, hackers thrive on a certain level of anonymity. That's especially when they're going to use that hacker skill against you. It's part of social engineering. So should you allow these accounts? And the answer is, no, there, there's, there is a famous quote by Ben Franklin, and I'm going to paraphrase this. I'm going to twist it a little bit. And uh, those who would trade privacy for a bit of convenience deserve neither privacy nor convenience. And it's, 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 I'm paraphrasing it and twisting it a little bit there. You've got the idea there. You give up some of that access to the network. You give them an account on the network, whether it's the Wi-Fi just to access the Internet, of course, or you give them access to your printers, you give them access to a computer there or, or any of that. What's happening is you're giving up some of your privacy. And yeah, it, it may be convenient right now, but I'll tell you, if you have some hacker come in, it's going to be mighty inconvenient for you. I know that there are companies out there that think, and, and, and CEOs and, and, and whatnot, that think, we, we don't have any bits and pieces of information that anybody would care about. We don't have anything that anybody would want. I'm going to paraphrase a, a, a wonderful book. It's called The Cuckoo's Egg. It's by Clifford Stoll. And the the gentleman, Clifford, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real story. He was an astrophysicist who, at one point in time, in the 80s, he, was, he had tenure, so they weren't going to be able to fire him. But they said, we can't afford to, you don't have any grants right now, and we can't afford to have you sit around doing nothing, so we're going to have you work on the computers over here. And he went chasing after a small little error, a matter of under a dollar in expense in, in the entire mainframe system. And he chased after it. And what he found out was there was this gentleman, and I use that term very loosely, 
off in Germany who is accessing their systems. Now, he wasn't accessing top secret information or anything like that. He was accessing invoices and and billing and shipping statements. But what he was doing was he's he was putting together all of this information bit by bit, piece by piece, to determine at the time some very sensitive information. Not only, you know, if, uh, think of it like this. This was one of the examples. If there are a bunch of radiation suits that are shipped to this particular Air Force base, there is a good possibility that they have nuclear weapons there. Not only that, but he could tell by the amount of those suits and the amount of the other inconsequential items exactly how many of those nuclear weapons were there. And frequently even deeper information. Now, I'm simplifying this, and the book is an amazing, fun read. But it's a matter of even some of the most inconsequential information on your network can be used to decipher some very consequential things for your company. This is why I tell everyone, don't set up any guest accounts, not even for accessing the Internet. You want them to be completely separate from your network, every part of your network, completely and, yeah, that may be a very conservative approach, very drastic approach. But if you follow that, you won't wind up with the inconvenience of giving up your privacy. This is Benjamin Rockwell. Back to you, Hank. Thank you, Benjamin. What is low Earth orbit Internet access? Well, it's also known as LEO, Internet Service. We have had satellite communications dating back to July of 1962. Television programming would time the available orbit of the satellite to televise their news broadcast. Shortly after, in August 1964, we had available satellites in geosynchronous orbit that allow satellites to match the Earth's rotation. Located at 22,000, 236 miles above Earth's equator. This position is a valuable spot for continuous communications and was first implemented for monitoring weather, communications, and obviously surveillance. Internet access via satellite is the only real option if you live in a rural area with no DSL, cable, or fiber internet options. Satellite access offers faster speed than dial-up though often it's more expensive than other internet options. I've used this form on a cruise ship in the open ocean and in national parks where communication towers are not allowed. We think of data traveling the speed of light, which in a vacuum is 186,282 miles per second. With terrestrial communications, that is near instantaneous and for most it's within a blink of an eye. But with satellite communications, 22,236 miles up and 22,236 miles down, that comes out to a quarter of a second. When you calculate the time for a total message transmission, it averages out to about two-thirds of a second. The time to travel the packet of information from one end to the other is called latency, and that is noticeable. Let's restate that. It averages out to about 10 to 12 megabits per second for internet access. But when there's no other means of data communication, it's better than the alternative of no communication or no connection. Soon this will be replaced by low Earth orbit satellites. Elon Musk's Starlink project with nearly $900 million in FCC subsidies will soon bring broadband internet to rural areas. The low end of the broadband internet is defined as 25 megabits per second. Starlink is designed to become part of a satellite array providing 5G services worldwide. The first phase will total 1,584 satellites, with eventual plans to expand to 12,000 
and then to 42,000 to increase coverage, connectivity, and data throughput. The majority of satellites orbiting the Earth do so at altitudes between 100 and 1,243 miles above the Earth. This orbital travel is called low Earth orbit, or LEO, due to the satellite's relative closeness to the Earth. Satellites in LEO typically take between 90 minutes to 2 hours to complete one full orbit around the Earth. The latency at the highest point of 1,243 miles is a much shorter distance compared to the 22,236 miles for geosynchronous orbit. The delay due to distance is called latency, which translates into a theoretical internet access speed between 50 to 150 megabits per second. Leon Musk said that later versions of Starlink would include inter-satellite links. He said that the company would keep Starlink satellites in orbit for four to five years before deorbiting and replacing them with newer, more capable models. A question often raised is, are there any cameras on the Starlink satellite? The answer is no. There are close to a thousand Starlink satellites in orbit today. The problem is you have to have many satellites orbiting to make up for the fact that you can't stay in one spot above the Earth because you need several satellites overhead at any one time to cover many users. They are visible to the naked eye and appear as a string of pearls or a train of bright lights moving in a straight line across the dark sky. The projected speed is estimated to be from 50 megabits per second to 150 megabits per second. Just remember, the ad in small print says up to speed. Of course, you're not going to get that maximum speed on a continuous basis. It's just up to 150 megabits per second. While Starlink is slated to cost about $99 a month, a higher monthly cost on average than the what the Americans currently pay. 51% of Americans say plan to sign up for Starlink satellite internet service once the beta program becomes available to them, while only 5% of Americans currently use a satellite internet connection. 64% say they'd be willing to switch to satellite internet with a rollout of Starlink. 55% says they'll switch to Starlink internet at a higher cost if it resulted in faster internet speed for their household. The most important factor for people considering making a switch include high quality streaming, 74% of those that were surveyed, high fidelity video calls, 72%, and online gaming at 56% of those that were surveyed. The majority of satellites orbiting the Earth do so at altitudes between 100 and 1243 miles above the Earth. The problem is you have to have many satellites orbiting to make up for the fact that you can't stay in one spot above the Earth, because you need several satellites overhead at any one time to cover many users. They are visible to the naked eye and appear as a string of pearls or a train of bright lights moving in a straight line across the dark sky. In October of last year, SpaceX said users in the Better Than Nothing beta test which involves a network of nearly 800 satellites beaming the internet service down to Earth, could expect speeds of between 50 to 150 megabits per second. Can you imagine when it gets to 42,000 satellites circ circling the Earth and they can be seen with the naked eye? I guess I'll be humming and singing a different tune waiting for Windows 10 to power on from my blue heaven to string of pearls. <laughs> Space has become a junkyard, and it's getting worse. Starlink has a competitor, OneWeb. OneWeb will offer satellite broadband next year. They say it's running just about a year behind Elon Musk. SpaceX is beaming Starlink broadband from low Earth orbit into the homes of beta testers in Canada and northern United States right now, and competitor OneWeb says it won't be far behind. At one point years ago, Musk was working closely with OneWeb when it was going by the name of Worldview, that's VU, before opting to blaze his own trail with Starlink. OneWeb would go on to secure funding from Richard Branson's Virgin Group, SoftBank, Airbus, 
and Qualcomm, among others, and finally began launching batches of satellites to build its 648 bird constellation in early 2020. But after just a few launches and just 74 total satellites, the coronavirus pandemic hit, and in March, one web filed for bankruptcy. Enter a new ownership group led by Indian conglomerate Bharti Enterprises and the British government, which owns equal shares in the venture. With one web now re-emerging, Barty pledged that the company will be able to make up ground in the coming months. One web will be up and running for 50 degrees north of late quarter of next year. Therefore, by October to November of 2021, we will have most of Northern Europe, Alaska, and the North and South Poles covered. During a live stream keynote talk organized by the International Telecommunications Union, Barty said that by May to June of next year, that's 2022, which is less than 18 months, OneWeb's constellation will cover the entire globe, every inch of the world. If that timeline works out, it would put OneWeb almost exactly one year behind Starlink, which began serving northern latitudes with its better-than-nothing beta earlier this year. Other competitors will emerge to offer satellite internet service. There is no governing body that controls who can or cannot launch satellites. We will have a major space junkyard. We're building a great garbage shell around the Earth, full of defunct satellites in time and tiny pieces of junk. The Pacific Ocean is already home to two monstrous, swirling vortexes of human junk. There are tangle fishing nets, garbage bags, and millions of tiny pieces of plastic swirling in the waves from Japan to the California coast. The stream of debris weaves its way across the world's largest ocean. The disjointed mass of waste is known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The majority of its junk, almost half of that garbage, comes from fishing equipment used on commercial vessels. Abandoned netting and gear, lost or discarded at sea, form large clots that circulate in the patch for years. Something similar is happening overhead, between us and the stars. At the edge of the atmosphere, ensnared by the Earth's gravity, are masses of metal that we've been sending into orbit since 1957. Satellites are as big as a bus and as small as a toaster. They become an essential component of our daily lives. Telecom satellites aren't immortal, however, and eventually they'll stop working. After death, they continue their orbit. We've been filling space with junk for over the last six decades building a great garbage shell as we've launched more and more satellites into space. The problem has gotten progressively worse. Its existence threatens newly launched satellites and rockets and poses trouble for spacecraft already in orbit, like the International Space Station, and the systems that we depend on for our daily activities on Earth. Space debris is extremely dangerous. Something the size of a AAA battery could punch right through the space station. We know exactly when space morphed from unspoiled void to planetary dump. It started back in October of 1957. The Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1, and it was the first human-made object to orbit the Earth. In January 1958, it re-entered the atmosphere and burned up. By the time humans landed on the moon in July of 1969, Hundreds of satellites have been sent to space. The number of live satellites currently orbiting the Earth stands at almost 2,800. According to a database maintained by the Union of Concerned Scientists, almost three times that amount are defunct. The junk has been building up. As we launch more and more satellites into space, the problem has gotten progressively worse. Cluttering orbit with satellites is a problem long recognized. NASA was acutely aware of the problems space junk could pose for access to space. The probability of satellite collisions increases as more satellites are launched. Collisions produce a spattering of orbital fragments, increasing the probability of further collisions. This produces more fragments, increasing the risk of collisions, and so on. Space has become exponentially busier 
and when they go up, they track from the ground. Orbits are precisely calculated by organizations like the United States Space Surveillance Network, or otherwise known as SSN. What isn't as closely tracked is the material shed from rockets or payloads during launch. Millions of tiny fragments generated by spacecraft being worn down by the harshness of space or the metallic fireworks created by an in-orbit explosion of leftover fuel or batteries. It's these untracked and unseen pieces of junk that poses the greatest danger. According to databases maintained by the European Space Agency and the SSN, there are now around 25,000 objects in orbit. Of these, 55% reside in the lower Earth orbit, an altitude lower than 1,240 miles. In the next three to five years, giant constellations containing thousands of satellites are expected to be placed into orbit. Organizations like SpaceX, as well as e-commerce giant Amazon and telecommunications company OneWeb, have all proposed their own mega constellations for a lower Earth orbit. If they succeed, the amount of satellites could increase by as much as 600%, fundamentally changing the space environment. Such a large injection to orbit will place a huge amount of strain on our current monitoring capabilities. Today's space object databases are comprehensive, but they're not complete. Private companies like Leo Labs work adjacent to SSN and the Space Forces Space Fence and other researchers to map the orbital environment. But the space is big and dark. Satellites are one thing, but statistical models provide almost unfathomable estimates for small chunks of junk. There are 900,000 pieces of debris smaller than 10 centimeters and over 128 million pieces less than one centimeter orbiting the Earth. According to the most recent estimate of the ESA Space Debris Office, speeding around the Earth at over 17,000 miles per hour, these scraps become stray bullets. They can perforate, chip, or ding bigger spacecraft, and they're so small that detection and tracking is nearly impossible. We need to do more to monitor and catalog all dangerous debris that pose a risk to active satellites. We need to collectively compile and share all of the data into a single coherent database. We need to start space debris management and develop means of cleanup. We haven't even started yet to do that. When it comes to the planet, you only need to look at the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to understand how hard it is to do a cleanup. Space would even be harder to sweep up. Companies are getting better at creating rocket bodies and satellites designed to fall back to Earth. But there's already a lot of junk up there do nothing but clog up the space highway. The one thing we need to do is start steadily pulling some satellites and some of the large debris out of space. There are currently no debris removal methods. Space is often referred to as being the common heritage of all humankind. Everyone should have equal access and benefits from its use. Who is responsible for decluttering the orbits? Hey, that's a tricky question. It's time we need to think about regulating space. It's impossible not to think of the Pacific clogged with plastic when bottle caps and fluorescent junk were discovered in the stomachs of seabirds in the late 1960s. The public began to take a keen interest in the plastic problem. It was a moment of realization, and we were awake to the unintended consequences of our actions. We still consume single-use plastic with reckless abandon. Turtles still wash up on shore. The shells squeeze in the shape of an hourglass by milk rings discarded years ago. We are slow to act. We're on the cusp of a similar moment in space. Collisions will become more commonplace. Debris will become more plentiful and potentially more damaging. A catastrophic collision is inevitable. The time to act is now. <laughs> Presenting Marty Winston with his all hands on tech. Coronavirus ineffective tech hall of shame. During the past 10 months, I've received different press notices of tech products that claim will protect you from coronavirus. Some of the claims seems to overtax my sense of logical science. 
I pass them on to Marty to comment on. You probably know the term placebo, something that looks like a real cure but really imparts only a psychological, not physiological effect. It doesn't truly cure anything, but sometimes some people who think it has a therapeutic impact may respond as if it actually does. It's really a fake cure. And sometimes, especially in the gold rush of fear-driven pandemic purchasing, there's tech gear that falls into that category. In truth, its only impact is the buyer's belief in it. In truth, it's ineffective. This report is a coronavirus ineffective tech hall of shame. Let's be specific. This is not about surface disinfection. It's about products that want you to think that they'll stop you from becoming infected by inhaling airborne coronavirus. To be fair, for a lot of products out there, the people behind them really believed that they could help. They simply didn't understand the science fully enough to recognize their bad assumptions. For example, for a long time, even still for many, HVAC people thought that putting UVC into the ductwork, and even the CDC recognizes UVC as effective at disinfection. Well, they thought that by disinfecting every cubic foot of indoor air, it would mean actual protection. Nope. You might disinfect everything six times an hour, but that means on average you're five minutes away from the last or the next recirculation. The problem is that when an infected person comes inside and sneezes or coughs, you may have less than 10 seconds to stop that from infecting you. Five minutes can't cut it. One company, Brondell, truly believed that they are pro-sanitizing air purifier with AG Plus technology could be an effective coronavirus countermeasure. It's a pretty good air purifier to combat allergies or odors, but it takes 15 minutes to disinfect a space and cannot stop an infected sneeze from reaching your face. They incorporate three technologies that are not on the short list that the CDC recognizes as effective at disinfection. It has a HEPA filter. It has electrostatics. Now, they're not the only ones out there to refer to that as a plasma generator making negative ions. Let's clarify. Plasma. A plasma, by definition, is a superheated gas. If this really made plasma, the unit would melt down and your house would catch fire. Nice air purifier, but not a true COVID countermeasure. Vironair, V-I-R-O-N-A-I-R-E, also talks about HEPA and negative ions. Do you remember what ions are? Everything that talks about ions is using some catalyst to create them out of hydrogen and oxygen. The problem is that those H's and O's often combine in harmful and dangerous ways. That's how you generate those dangerous X and Z gases, things like vaporous hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyls, and ozone, which eat at your respiratory passages. Your odds of infection go up, not down. Vironair also makes a statement that's scientifically ridiculous. They claim their air treatment is hermetically sealed, meaning the thing that they say is handling and conditioning air isn't letting any air in or out. Treating air that it can't let in? Your garden probably has a rock that's just as good at doing that. We saw a press release from a California company, Seguro, announcing Air Safe, which you wear on your head. It says that it, quote, Powerful fan purifies the air, then delivers it as a clean curtain of fresh air to the nose and mouth, end quote. The problem here is that it depends on HEPA, which didn't make that CDC short list of effective technology. They're clever. They never directly say that this thing will protect you from a coronavirus infection, but their wording seems intent on drawing people to that conclusion. You may have heard of molecule air purifiers. That's molecule with a K. 
They call their technology PECO, PECO, an acronym for their term, photoelectrochemical oxidation, which they claim does away with the shortcomings of photocatalytic tech, you know, the one that produces those caustic X and Z gases. They claim not to produce any harmful byproducts, but I don't believe it. It comes down to plain old physical chemistry. If their photocatalytic tech is working, it generates those gases, and if it's not working, it may not be generating those gases, but it wouldn't be doing any good either. Molecule hasn't sent us one for reviewer testing, and our request for a call from one of their technical experts hasn't yet been honored. For the moment, skepticism seems appropriate. Not that it matters. Its airflow rates are too slow and its geometry all wrong for intercepting live virus in real time. So, for preventing coronavirus infection, it too is ineffective tech. The upcoming Luft Duo, that's L-U-F-T, claims to be the first ever portable and filterless air purifier. That's just a brag. We've seen others. And this one uses photocatalytic tech the tech that may generate those harmful X and Z gases. CAZ, Clean Air Zone, comes out and says, quote, eliminates COVID-19 virus, end quote, which it might do somewhere, but there is absolutely no testing available anywhere to prove that, and certainly not for the virus riding a sneeze or a cough on its way to infect you. Their big claim is combining water and microbiotics in a proprietary natural enzyme formula that flows down vertical walls inside. An interior fan draws in air, and that treated water flow is supposed to capture pollution. It might, but that's not the same as intercepting coronavirus contagion in real time. So, like those HVAC ducts, this is protection for spaces, but it can't keep infected coughs off any faces. There was an intro by NS Nanotech at CES of what they call, quote, the world's first solid-state product to generate coronavirus-neutralizing far UVC light, end quote. That's not true. Other products use UVC LEDs, including some from GE. It would have been way easy to fact-check that. But the deeper deception is in the suggestion that this can be effective. For UVC to effectively disinfect, the three most important factors are the intensity of exposure, the duration of exposure, and the distance of exposure. There is no solid-state UVC emitter that offers enough intensity to be effective without a long exposure period. Physics won't allow both a long exposure duration and more than a tiny whisper of airflow at the same time. If you up the airflow, you cut the exposure time. Without more duration at weak intensity, disinfection can't happen. And without more aggressive airflow, it can't intercept live virus in real time. Strike three for NS Nanotech, their own product they call shortwave light purifier, and the CryptoLights products for which their LED is the UVC source. Shame on them. Data Micro sent all four PuraPot products for review and engaged in a long email conversation. I think they're more in a hall of oops situation than any hall of shame. Photocatalytic tech can always produce dangerous gases, and theirs produces hydroxyls, one of the most dangerous. But by clever design, they manage to keep those hydroxyls inside their product and not release them into breathable air. By the way, instead of using ultraviolet to excite a photocatalyst, they use visible blue light. One result of their design is that the hydroxyls quickly decay, milliseconds, so the bad X and Z gases don't come out. But these products work with relatively slower, weaker air flows. They take a while, but they can eventually disinfect an airspace. What they can't do is to disrupt the flight path of infected cough or sneeze aerosols before other people get infected. It's a case of believing that disinfecting airspace is in some way productive, and as you now know, that's a widely held myth. My poster child for this hall of shame is next. They even sent a letter from a real or maybe pretend lawyer with a warning that the parent company in Ireland will sue me for extortion under Irish law if I dare to try to talk to one of their people to find out more about how their product works. 
The companies involved are Plasma Air International, Well Air Group, and Novaris U.S. They never sent a product for review, but I did report what I knew <laughs> to the Washington Post and to the FDA. The product is named Active Pure. Here's a quote from their product description. Quote, A fan brings in free oxygen and water molecules and then converts them into special ions that then pass through an internal UV light. These ionized particles are then sent back out into a room to find and destroy microorganisms. Find? Really? Sell me a bridge. Here's the issue. Even when energized by UV or anything else, there are only a few ways that oxygen and water can ionically combine, and all those ways generate irritating to caustic byproducts, those X and Z gases. Every one of those things attacks your respiratory passages, weakening their natural defenses and making you more susceptible, not less susceptible, to infection. So the idea that a reviewer might let everybody know what may be in the Active Pure Playbook well, that apparently scared them into trying that a rescue for extortion ploy. Got news for them. This isn't Ireland. This is the USA, where the strongest defense against slander or libel accusations is the truth. And this report is, in part, their failure to block that. They get the front hall in the coronavirus ineffective tech hall of shame. Next time... Well, think of it as Wingman Chronicles. It's a different way to think about dash cams and some largely untried ways they can be used. That report is called Enjoying the Cam on the Dash When There Isn't a Crash. Catch the ride next week. Thank you, Marty. Public Service Announcements Computer Club Meetings in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut Tri-State Region most of the computer clubs have begun to schedule their general monthly meetings through teleconferencing. For updated information, visit their website and get the necessary meeting ID for the teleconference meeting. The Brookdale Computer Users Group will have a presentation on a PC user's guide for avoiding the grief of losing your information. Thursday, January the 28th, meeting time, 6.45 p.m., via Zoom virtual meeting, their website is bcug.com. The New York Amateur Computer Club has rescheduled the speech recognition presentation for Thursday, February the 11th at 7 p.m. via Zoom virtual meeting, and the website is nyacc.org for further information to get into the meeting. The Amateur Computer Group of New Jersey, their website is acgnj.org. The Princeton PC Users Group. Their website is ppcug-nj.apcug.org. The Long Island Macintosh Users Group. Their website is limac.org. The Westchester PC Users Group. Their website is wpcug.org. <laughs> Our website is pcradioshow.org. We are heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, streaming on the Internet. Podcasts of this program is available on prn.fm on the Internet. If you have any questions for us, just send us an email address to hank at pcradioshow.org. In the meantime, stay in touch and remember to do regular backups. I'm Hank Key, and on behalf of Joe King... Michael Horowitz, Marty Winston, and Benjamin Rockwell, we thank you for listening. Stay safe and healthy until we meet again, same time, same station, next week. <laughs>